Today's podcast is brought to you by Hypervape. Hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and reliable. That's H Y P R V A P E. Hypervape.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode, we'll explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. is episode 11. We've had a lot of new listeners join us recently, so if you're new to the show, welcome. We look forward to becoming old friends. Today's episode is all about Judge Roy Bean. Judge Roy Bean is one of the most legendary figures in the Old West. His exploits as a cantankerous old coot are well known, often fictionalized, and are highly entertaining. But the truth about this surly saloon keeper is every bit as strange. He was a killer, a thief, a con man, and a corrupt public servant. He beat his wife and lusted after a British actress. He was a scoundrel of epic proportions and the man known as the law west of the Pecos. He was indeed a quirky character and a tough hombre who favored large sombreros to 10-gallon hats a man whose reputation grew as big as Texas. Judge Roy Bean has a story that's as wild as the West. (laughs) Bean, whose first name, like his father's, was actually Fantley, with a PH, was born to impoverished parents in 1825. Growing up in Mason County, Kentucky, Roy Bean left home at age 16. The youngest of five children, Bean set out on a flatboat to New Orleans to find work. His older brother, Sam, had left earlier and eventually wound up fighting in the Mexican-American War. After the war, Sam settled in Chihuahua, Mexico, where his younger brother Roy came to join him. In 1848, the Bean brothers opened a trading post in Chihuahua. But it didn't last long. Roy Bean was busy making himself a legend. Dressing the part as a young Mexican charro, Bean preferred the silver conchos and large brim of a sombrero to the traditional American cowboy hat. But the clothes did nothing to camouflage the rough-edged American beneath them. In a bar fight, after a Mexican desperado had threatened he wanted to kill a gringo, Roy Bean shot and killed the man. Not wanting to be charged with murder by Mexican authorities, the Bean brothers quickly fled town. By the spring of 1849, Roy had joined another brother, Joshua, in the city of San Diego, where Josh would become mayor the following year. Joshua Bean was San Diego's first mayor, elected in 1850. But the city went bankrupt only two years later and the government replaced the position with a board of trustees. Meanwhile, the youngest Bean continued to attract attention to himself, this time from the ladies. Considered to be a handsome young man, Roy Bean sought the affections of various women around town. Ultimately, this led to some challenges 
and finally a duel with a Scotsman named Collins. Mr. Bean, why it is such an unexpected pleasure to see you today. Well, hello, Roy. <laughs> hey, I'll plan to stop by with some hot biscuits tomorrow. All right? Yoo-hoo, Mr. Bean! Can you come help me up on this saddle? Hey, that's my girl there, you scoundrel. Get your hands off of her. I'll challenge you to a duel, you miserable skunk. I'll shoot you dead as a doornail. Beg pardon, sir, but you couldn't hit a bull's rump with a handful of banjos. I accept your challenge, and you'd best bring a friend with you to claim your remains. Oh, and let's make this interesting. I insist we do the duel on horseback. For whatever reason, dueling had been making kind of a comeback in the South and in the Old West, though it had been considered illegal for years, both here and overseas. Whether it was bravado or stupidity, shooting at each other from horseback was far more difficult and improbable than the traditional duel at 20 paces. On February 24, 1852, Bean proved himself to be the better marksman and shot Mr. Collins in the arm. Of course, both men were quickly arrested, jailed, and charged with intent to kill. But while serving his time in jail, Bean continued to receive visits from all his lady friends. They brought him gifts of food, wine, and flowers. Oh, you poor thing, Mr. Bean, cooped up here in this smelly old hen house. I brought you a couple cigars you can enjoy while you wait for these men to come to their senses. Why, well, Roy Bean, I do declare you are wasting away to nothing here in this old jail cell. Don't these men feed you in here? Well, look, I bought you some nice, fresh biscuits and gravy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, put a little uh, meat on those big, strong bones of yours. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Bean! I brought you something to sip on when you get to feeling parched. I might come by tomorrow with some homemade tamales, if it's all the same to you. I just can't bear the thought of you spending another minute in here all by your lonesome. See you real soon, Roy. Real soon. Them hot tamales do sound pretty good. After two months in jail, Bean did receive some homemade tamales, and they included a special ingredient, knives. Hidden inside the tamales were knives Bean used to dig his way out of his jail cell. And on April 17th, Bean escaped. Bean traveled north to San Gabriel, California, where he reunited with his brother Joshua and became a bartender in Josh's saloon. Once again, things quickly turned sour, and Joshua was murdered in November of the same year. Roy inherited the bar, known as the Headquarters Saloon, and it looked like he might be settling down. In 1854, Bean's penchant for the ladies proved troublesome again. He had been courting a woman who was suddenly kidnapped and forced to marry a Mexican officer. Not one to back down, Bean challenged the groom to a duel and killed the man. But six of the groom's friends grabbed Bean, put him on a horse, and tied a rope around his neck. Assuming the horse would just bolt away and leave Bean hanging, the men rode away, certain they had ended Bean's story. But the horse didn't budge. Then the reluctant bride, who had been hiding behind a tree, cut the rope, saving Bean's life. Bean was left with a lifelong reminder of the event, however, in the form of a permanent stiff neck and a scar from the rope burn around his neck. Bean left California soon after and rejoined his brother Sam in New Mexico, who had since been elected the first sheriff of Dona Ana County. In 1861, Roy and Sam operated a general store that served liquor and had a fine billiard table. At some point, Bean bought himself a cannon, which sat out front of the store. What the heck do you plan to do with that cannon, Roy? Well, it's a conversation piece. Good for starting or stopping one. 
When a band of Apaches attacked the town, however, Bean's cannon was employed to defend the town, and it persuaded the Indians to retreat. Go on, scat, you red devils. Take some of this gunpowder home to your squaws. Look at them run, Sam. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. <laughs> but as time went on, Bean proved himself to be even more of an ornery cuss. During the Civil War, the Confederate Army invaded New Mexico, but by 1862, they had lost all their supplies and were forced to retreat to San Antonio. Bean took money from his brother's safe and decided to join the Confederates as they retreated. For the next 20 years, Bean tried his hand at a number of different ventures around San Antonio. He worked as a teamster, ran a firewood business where he cut down his neighbor's trees. He tried his hand as a dairy farmer until he was caught watering down the milk. Then he became a butcher for a while, rustling unbranded cattle from nearby ranchers. Gosh darn it, Roy, can't you read? That sign says no trespassing. Ain't you got no trees on your land? Roy, this milk tastes funny. We just can't use it for bacon. Either you have a sick cow or you're feeding it too much water. Well, gee whiz, that's funny. I could have sworn I had me 50 head of cattle this morning. At the age of 43, Bean married an 18-year-old girl in October of 1868 named Virginia Chavez, and it didn't take long before the honeymoon was over. Bean was arrested just barely a year after the marriage for aggravated assault and threatening the life of his brand new bride. Though the marriage was rocky, the couple still managed to have four children. The family lived in poverty in a slum known as Beanville, a situation not all that unfamiliar to how Bean grew up as a child. Bean opened his own saloon in Beanville and sometime around the late 1870s, he heard that the railroad companies were pushing west. He wanted to capitalize on the influx of men, money, and lack of a place to spend it. Upon hearing of Bean's plans to pull up stakes, another store owner in Beanville bought all of Bean's possessions in an effort to hasten his move. I was so anxious to have this unscrupulous character out of this neighborhood. It was worth the $900 so he could leave. Bean was separated from his wife at the time, and he left his children with friends. Bean took the money and purchased a tent, a few supplies to resell, and bought 10 barrels of whiskey before he moved west. By 1882, he had a tent saloon in a city just a few miles from the 8,000 railroad workers he planned to fleece. He named the town, aptly, Vinegaroon, a perversion of the Spanish word vinegaron. It was a strange but telling choice. Vinegaron, coincidentally, is also the name given to a whip-tailed scorpion, a frightening thing to encounter, but one that poses no threat to man. This weird member of the arachnid family emits a non-venomous but unpleasant odor of vinegar when threatened. It's a bit like Bean himself. Being 200 miles from the nearest court, a Texas ranger requested that a local law jurisdiction be established in Vinegaroon. Bean volunteered, and in August of 1882, he was quickly appointed as Justice of the Peace for the Territory. A justice of the peace is a position requiring no formal training or experience, and Bean wasted no time filling the role. In fact, his first case was heard on July 25th, where he presided over a case seven days before he was legally able to do so. It wasn't long before Bean was calling himself the law west of the Pecos. With his tent as his courtroom, he began to hear cases relying on only one law book. That book was the Revised Statutes of Texas, 1879 edition, which he continued to refer to as his only legal reference for the rest of his career. Some have said that they thought the book may have been upside down as he referenced it. When new law books arrived, 
Bean simply used them as kindling for his fire. Among his first acts as Justice of the Peace, Judge Roy Bean went to a competitor's saloon and started shooting up the place. I'm the law around these parts, and I proclaim this here establishment officially closed. Why, just look at this place. You got holes in the walls and broken glass everywhere. It's just plumb disgraceful. Soon, the shameless self-promoter began to exhibit his accelerated eccentricities, starting with his own brand of special courtroom customs. Jurors were chosen from his best barroom customers, and they were expected to buy a drink during every court recess. Doling out whiskey and frontier justice, Judge Roy Bean was just getting started leaving his indelible mark on the West. His strange proceedings made for some unusual rulings. For instance, when an Irishman named Paddy O'Rourke shot a Chinese laborer, the court was quickly surrounded by a mob of 200 Irishmen, all who promised to lynch Bean if O'Rourke wasn't freed. Bean leafed through his law book and ruled that homicide is the killing of a human being. However, I find no law against the killing of a Chinaman. Case dismissed. Court is adjourned. May God have mercy on your soul. The bar is now open. Just a few months later, the railroad men moved further west. So Bean moved some 70 miles to the town of Strawbridge. And it was here where he finally sent for his children and had them come live with him in his saloon. The youngest boy, Sam, had to sleep on the pool table. Bean wasn't welcome in Strawbridge, however, and he couldn't seem to attract any customers. Perhaps it was because a competitor had spiked Bean's supplies of whiskey with kerosene. How about a whiskey there, barkeep? <laughs> what the hell? I don't know what you call it, but it sure as hell ain't whiskey. It tastes like kerosene. Once again, Bean pulled up stakes and headed to Eagle's Nest a town 20 miles west of the Pecos River. The original landowner, who also owned a saloon, had sold 640 acres of land to the railroad, with the stipulation that under no circumstances would the railroad lease or sell any portion of that land to Bean. Yet O'Rourke, that same Irishman whose court case Bean had dismissed, told Bean to use the railroad right-of-way which was not covered by the seller's contract. And for the next 20 years, Bean squatted on land he had no right to use. Bean named his new saloon the Jersey Lily, after the actress Lily Langtree. Miss Langtree figured prominently in Bean's life, although perhaps at first she didn't know it. Miss Langtree never actually met the man, but their correspondence was rumored for years with Bean as the primary source of these rumors. You see, Bean had been fascinated with Miss Langtree for a great many years. He wrote her, and she wrote back. So he continued his communications, well past the time the actress faded from the spotlight. But if Bean was a character, perhaps Langtree was too. Born Emily Charlotte LeBrenton in October of 1853, Miss Langtree's sudden rise to fame as the Jersey Lily happened during a strange series of events. Already an accomplished actress, Langtree was known only locally. At the age of 20, Emily married a wealthy Irish landowner named Edward Langtree. However, Mr. Langtree turned out to be far less wealthy than he first appeared to be, and her family despised the man. After her brother's death in 1877, she fell into a deep depression. A wealthy friend arranged an invitation to a social event attended by a number of prominent artists and literary figures. While still in mourning over her brother's death, she wore a simple black dress and no jewelry, and she isolated herself in the corner of the room, hoping not to attract any attention. However, her stunning beauty and poise had just the opposite effect. Among the guests was Frank Miles, an artist who had known of her work in the theater and was already smitten with her. He had made several sketches of her during the evening, and he boasted of her beauty to everyone he met. Within a week, 
The Langtrees were overwhelmed with social invitations. Miles' sketches had been sold, and photographers and painters were clamoring for her to model for them. One of these portraits was called A Jersey Lily by John Edward Millay, which became very well known, and the nickname Jersey Lily stuck. Lily Langtree became the name by which she would become world famous. Her picture soon found its way to the American West, while Miss Langtree herself found her way into the beds of royalty. Langtree's marital dissatisfaction was no secret, though she remained married for many years. She was linked to affairs with the Prince of Wales, and eventually that led to a cordial relationship with Queen Victoria and her daughter Alexandra. She was also romantically linked to the Earl of Shrewsbury. And through all of this, Edward Langtree remained her faithful husband. But prudish, she was not. In a quote attributed to Langtree and the Prince of Wales during their affair, Maggie McNeil of the Honest Courtesan website states that during a spat, the two lovers once said, I've spent enough on you to build a battleship. And you spent enough in me to float one. Among her close friends was the famous author, poet, essayist, and playwright Oscar Wilde, who helped Miss Langtree rocket to stardom. One might, by now, be wondering why Miss Langtree would even consider communications with the likes of Judge Roy Bean. Perhaps she hadn't known the shabby circumstances of Bean's court and of the desolate location of his saloon. Nevertheless, Lily Langtree began to tour the international theater circuit, which brought her as close as San Francisco during the life and time of Judge Roy Bean. She purchased a winery here in the U.S. in 1888 in Lake County, California. In 1897, she became an American citizen, and later that year, she used her land and her citizenship as evidence in the divorce of her husband. Meanwhile, Bean continued to write Miss Langtree and professed his adoration in remarkable ways. Perhaps he felt the need to be noticed among the many suitors Miss Langtree was rumored to have bedded. So, as a gift, Bean sent the woman a live caged bear, which fortunately escaped the moment the cage was opened to reveal its contents. Package for you? It's from a judge named Roy Bean. Ooh, wonderful, wonderful. Be a dear and open it, would you, darling? Maybe that's the reason we think girls like teddy bears when we court them today. Miss Langtree was an iconic figure in the American West for a time. Touring the playhouses in San Francisco and visiting the mining camps nearby, her likeness adorned posters and postcards, and impersonators and imposters soon joined the fray. Though it's doubtful that Langtree took Bean's communications as anything more than fan mail, Judge Roy Bean was smitten though by today's standards it might be considered stalking. Coincidentally, Bean's saloon was located in the town of Langtree, Texas, but the town was named after an unrelated engineer named George Langtree. Still, Bean named his saloon the Jersey Lily after the actress, and he adorned the walls of his saloon with replications of her likeness. He continued to brag of their correspondence to anyone who would listen. And of course, he continued to build on his legendary status. Bean dispensed his brand of justice with a wry sense of humor, and he ran his saloon with profit as the primary goal. It's been said he sold grizzly bear semen as an aphrodisiac. He had a large sign advertising iced beer outside the saloon. But the ice was just a piece of glass he would put in the bottom of a glass and use over and over again until one day he dropped it and it broke. Allegedly, he kept a severed head in a pickle jar, which apparently fell and broke during an earthquake in 1906. He kept a bear named Bruno chained outside on the porch of his saloon for a time. In movies and in books, Bean is often portrayed as a grisly, dispassionate, hanging judge. But this is untrue. The man only sentenced two people to hang, 
and one of them escaped before they got the noose around his neck. Langtree had no jail, so most of Bean's rulings were fines. Though required to do so, Bean never sent any money from these fines to the state. Instead, he kept every nickel for himself, often setting the fine for exactly the amount of money the person had on them. Bean's brand of justice was often hilarious. In one instance, he threatened a lawyer with hanging for use of profane language when the hapless attorney referred to the habeas corpus of his client. When a dead body was found on the edge of town, the cadaver was searched and found to be in possession of $40 cash and a pistol. When Judge Roy Bean was made aware of the circumstances, he fined the dead man $40 for carrying a concealed weapon and confiscated the pistol. In another case, he overruled a Texas Ranger's request that carrying firearms in public be banned in the town of Langtree. Bean ruled that carrying a firearm was legal because when a person was standing still, they ain't carrying a gun, they're holding it. And when they're moving, they're traveling through which is legal and therefore it's legal to keep your damned firearm. Case closed. May God have mercy on your soul. The bar is open. Bean closed every ruling and ceremony with that exact same phrase, including weddings and divorces, which technically he had no authority to preside over. Still, Bean performed $5 weddings and $10 divorces frequently. With the power so vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. May God have mercy on your soul. Case closed. The bar is open. In 1890, Bean heard that wealthy railroad developer Jay Gould was going to pass through Langtree. So Bean flagged down the train with the danger signal. Thinking the bridge was out, the train engineer stopped the train in a panic. Bean climbed aboard and calmly invited Gould and his daughter to visit the Jersey Lily Saloon as his guests. They did, but the resulting two-hour delay of the train caused a brief panic on the New York Stock Exchange when it was reported that Gould had been killed in a train crash. By the 1890s, Bean's irascible, cantankerous courtroom antics had made him a living legend. Travelers passing through Langtree often made a point of stopping to visit the dismal shack from which Bean dispensed frontier justice. Often they'd find him behind the bar or waiting on the porch, thinking of ways to relieve them of their money. Bean's national notoriety hit an all-time high in 1896 when he organized a world championship boxing title bout between Bob Fitzsimmons and Peter Maher. Although boxing was considered illegal in Texas and Mexico at the time, Bean reasoned that a tiny island in the middle of the Rio Grande was neither part of Mexico or Texas. The fight only lasted one minute and 35 seconds, but when Fitzsimmons won, it made national news and the infamous Judge Roy Bean became a household name. In the final years before his death, Bean spent much of his profits on the poor, helping to feed them and ensuring that the schoolhouse always had firewood in winter. Maybe the man had a soft spot after all. Bean fell ill during a visit to San Antonio after a bout of heavy drinking. He returned to Langtree and died on March 16, 1903. Just ten months later, Lily Langtree came to visit the famous saloon named in her honor. In his will, Bean left Lily Langtree his pistols, which she then donated to the town of Jersey, and they may even still be on display today. The Drift and Ramble podcast will continue after this. Come on, Billy. Let's ride out after them bandits to rob the train. Hang on a second, Clem. My vaporizer won't charge. Now how am I going to have a smoke? Well, Billy, it looks like you should have chose Hypervape. When it comes to e-cigarettes, why settle for something you picked up in the back of a saloon? But Clem, I spent a lot of money on this thing. How much you spend isn't how you measure quality. You measure quality through reliability, longevity, and value. Like this old horse your mom sold me. 
Gee, I guess you have been riding her a long time. You mean this horse or your mom? Why don't you mosey on over to hypervape.com and place an order, Billy? Old Paint and I will catch up to those bandits. Remember, hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and always reliable. That's hypervape.com. We're outlaws and good guys find quality. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Bean! Thanks to Audio Oblivious Productions and their cast for helping me bring this episode to life. It's amazing to have their support, and I'd like to thank the following individuals for lending their voices to our show. Austin Beach as Judge Roy Bean. Drew Prophet as Sam Bean and the Delivery Man. Mike Jansen as the Scotsman and the Prince of Wales. Scott Phillips as Neighbor Number 3 and the Bar Patron. Sarah Golding as Woman Number 2 and Lily Langtree. Danielle Reese as Woman Number 1 and Neighbor Number 2. Jeremy Hennessy as Neighbor Number 1. And our very own Cheryl Blizzen as the third woman and the Beanville Storekeeper. I'd like to thank all the people and podcasters who are part of the Pottern family, too. Pottern Family is a great way to find new podcasts simply by searching for the hashtag Pottern Family. You'll find shows ranging from full cast comedy and audio dramas like Audio Oblivious Productions' Winnebago Warrior, The Tale of John Wayneby, whose cast appeared in this episode, and you'll find other hilarious comedy podcasts like Super Pee Pee Time, Tattooed Bananas Podcast, The Mike Jolitz Show, as well as our personal favorite, The Unwritable Rant with Juliet Miranda. And these are only a few of the many excellent podcasts you'll find with the Pottern Family hashtag. In our last episode, we began reading reviews that listeners left for us on iTunes. We love to hear from you, and leaving a review for us on iTunes or Stitcher is a great way to show your support or leave feedback for your listening experience. This time, I'd like to read one of my favorite reviews from Jeff Mack is here. Came across this podcast via the Pottern Family hashtag on Twitter. I love it when you hear a podcast that isn't like anything else out there. Informative, fun, totally fascinating, loving it. Thanks for those kind words. We really appreciate it. Getting your feedback makes it all worthwhile. If you'd like us to read your review on an upcoming episode, leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Hi, this is Cheryl. Your feedback is important to us. If you have a comment or suggestion, we'd really love to hear from you. You can contact us through our website. That's driftandramble.com. You'll see a listener survey button on every page, and we'd really appreciate your input on the survey. Please take a few moments to complete it, and you'll have our thanks in return. Coming up on the next Drift and Ramble podcast, we'll hear from one of the West's most iconic figures. He was a buffalo hunter, an accidental Indian fighter, a Dodge City lawman, a U.S. Deputy Marshal, and a close personal friend of Wyatt Earp and President Theodore Roosevelt. Feared by men and irresistible to the ladies, he spent the first 30-some years of his life testing his mettle in the rough-and-tumble ways of the Old West, then spent the next 30 years of his life as a celebrity sports writer and boxing aficionado. The man I'm referring to, of course, is William Barclay Masterson, or Bat Masterson, as you may know him. We'll get a glimpse into this man's life in the Old West and how he transitioned as the Old West began to fade from the spotlight. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West. Well, how do you like it? All he's done so far is talk, and, and not with any real enthusiasm. Yes, that's what I thought. Not so good. I shall never forget it. We don't have any specific information, but it's very bad. This is getting real interesting. But uh, isn't that almost impossible? Even Stephen. But even the impossible can happen. What's the matter? <laughs> you don't feel like talking? 
Then you better pray. Americano! Ha, 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 ha.